Hello and welcome to another edition of Inside the Burrow, the FE podcast for and by fans. My name is Dan. I am joined uh, this week uh, with Shane and Jack as usual. And we finally did it. We finally made it through the dreaded summer doldrums. Uh, we are ready for week one, FAU taking on uh, top five Ohio State University, the Ohio State University. Hate calling them that, but we're kind of each give our kind of impression of the game. Really, I mean, if, if we're being honest, uh, there's no, uh, we're, we're no Medicare Mike, uh, for those that remember. We're not picking FAU no matter what. Uh, rest in but, peace, right? Yeah, rest in peace, Medicare Mike. He was a great guy. He was my neighbor for a while, actually. Um, wow. But anyways, a little bit of our uh, takes on the game and what we hope to see out of the game, and um, and we'll go from there. So a l- little bit of history. Really, there, there is no history. This game came about because of FAU's former athletic director, Pat Chun, who uh, fortunately for us got a better opportunity. He was up at Washington State, but he came from Ohio State. He had been at Ohio State for uh, for a long time, 15 years or something like that, and moved up the ranks there. And um, kind of set this game up. So uh, this is uh, the thank you, Pat Chun game. I think we are, uh, I think the, it's about 1.4 million. So this game will basically pay for, pay for Lane's salary for the year and then we'll move on. Um, but yeah, I think that that's really the, the biggest thing for me. You know, hopefully we, we, we come out injury free. Um, you know, Shane and Jack will, will dig a little bit into, you know, may, maybe who we can expect to be some starters uh, starting QB and stuff like that. But, you know, this is, this is another one of those games where hopefully, you know, we, we, uh, we, we don't get embarrassed too bad. Um, but Ohio State, you know, perennial college football um, program. And uh, I don't know. So, so Shane, what, what, are, you, what are you looking forward to? What, what are your thoughts uh, initially uh, about this game? Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm actually going to be up there, going with a large group of alumni. So it's another big college football stadium I can uh, check off. The last time, the last one we went to is we went to Wisconsin. Um, so that was a fun trip. Uh, so another Big Ten stadium. Uh, as for on the field, similar to Wisconsin, I'm hoping uh, that we can just do some good things. Uh, Ohio State's a little bit of a different creature, though. Uh, there is a with something they call a blue chip radio, uh, ratio, excuse me. Um, this website called the key play does it. Uh, and it's your ratio from four and five star recruits to two and three star recruits on the roster. So um, no team has ever won a national title without having uh, at least over 50% what they consider blue chip recruits. Okay. Four and five star recruits. Um, 81% of Ohio State's roster is blue chip recruits. That's number one in the country. They have more blue chip recruits than Alabama. Uh, it's, it's, it's unreal. More than LSU. They have the highest going into the season. They have the highest in the country. It's, um, they have freaks everywhere from J.K. Dobbins, their running back, to K.J. Hill at receiver, um, Victor Benjamin, who's from uh, my hometown, Coconut Creek. Uh, he's 6'4", 200 pounds, and runs a 4'5". It's, it's like one of those things that it's like kind of playing your older brother. You, you might be able to call the right play, but eventually they're just going to beat you because they're bigger and stronger. Uh, again, though, I, I want to see better than what we saw against OU last year. Just the poor tackling, the bad special teams, you know, um, Justin Fields is a very young quarterback, okay? He is raw. Um, for those who don't know, he was rated higher than Trevor Lawrence coming out of high school. So, you know, that's the type of talent we're dealing with here. But I would like to, you know, make them go 12 plays in the drive. You know, none of these just right. one play, 75 yards, two, two guys touch him type thing. You know, um, extend the game out a little bit. You know, so when we're coming home, you know, force a couple turnovers on the young quarterback and a couple of disguised coverages, sack them a couple times. So when we're coming home saying, Hey, there's a lot of good things we took out of here. We took on the best team in the country. And, and Shane, I, you actually just hit nail on the head. That's why I think we'll be able to make some things happen. Uh, if there's one weakness with Ohio state and 
they're all cyborgs. Uh, it's hard to find a weakness, but if there is one, it would be the inexperience on the offensive line. Uh, we've talked about that with, with FAU in the past, other teams, when it comes to players gelling, having experience, um, good chemistry with one another, the offensive line is by far the most important. We're expecting pretty good things from our defensive line this year, but so were we with the defensive line last year. So that being said, if we are able to get in uh, uh, Justin Fields' face for a little bit, cause a turnover, uh, who, who knows what can happen. Uh, we're looking for anything at this point. <laughs> yeah, we're looking yeah, for something. Exactly. Yeah. When I say anything can happen, I mean, you know, a, a glimmer of hope. K, K.J. Hill is going to be so tough to cover. They're their star wide receiver. Uh, we all love our DBs. We've been talking about that all offseason, guys, how much we love our defensive backs. But, I, I mean, just one step in the wrong direction and then he's gone. And we don't have anyone that can – that can chase him down. It's not even KJ Hill. That's my big. I see. I look at Victor Benderman. I actually say, well, maybe we got a little bit of the speed to run around with KJ Hill. Uh, but our corners aren't, our defensive backs aren't exactly long. Um, Victor Benderman, 6'4", 200 pounds. I mean, you, we could cover him well, and it's just, he's bigger and stronger just than everyone else. Throw, throw the ball higher. Yeah. Than, uh, you know, it's, yeah. What, um, one of the things that I'm, I don't know, it's not necessarily concerned with, but I can see this happening being a lot of Owl fans being very frustrated on more on offense. Um, it's about the play calling. I, we're not, we're not going to give away our best plays and, you know, best formations against Ohio state, you know, so it's certainly with UCF coming up the next, the, the next week, we're not going to give UCF much to go off on film you know, like this, hopefully this will be. I, I disagree I, a little bit with you, Dan. I, I disagree. I, I think a lot of times, I think people over say that. I think offenses tend to be a little bit more, not basic. I don't want to say that, but you know, there's only so many route patterns and stuff and, and running plays you can design. I mean, we do read option. We go fast. We hand the ball off quick. We use our tight ends in the flat. Right. You know, we move our tight end around. It's not going to be huge. You know, we can't just not hide 75 percent of our plays and run dives for four quarters yeah. and plus you want them to work on those things i'd rather them right do a good play you know yeah. execute a few good plays and say hey let's take these plays to ucf because we executed those plays the best sometimes yeah. you know, good executed offense always beats good executed defense the rules are designed for it, okay? Yeah. So it's one of those things where if we have a good play that we get to Harrison Bryan on, let's say we convert a nice third and 11 against Ohio State, we say, ooh, you know, let's take that play. So we have a third and long versus UCF. Let's go to that because they, that was the play they executed best. I think, um, you know. I, mean, I, I don't think that they're, they're going to run, you know, the same five, five plays, but I just think, if, you know, if, if the ball's not moving, I don't think that we're going to, you know, that they're going to go necessarily out of their way. They'll certainly work on, uh, on, on good plays, but I think we might have some one frustrate frustration because uh, Ohio state, you know, playing against a defense like that. Um, but two, if, you know, especially when, when things start going bad, uh, if they start going bad, if and when, but I don't know, that's just some, something I was thinking about that might add to the frustration. So I'm just going to sit back and enjoy being able to watch. Lane will have a bigger bag of tricks for UCF. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't yeah. think we're gonna see any like, you know, double passes or anything like that in Columbus. Uh, I, I think he'll bring out a, like you said, Shane, his, his bag of tricks when we're playing. I see a fake punt? I could, I definitely, I could see a fake punt happening. Yeah, I mean, it's considering how the punts went last year in, in Norman. I mean, you you might as well just fake punt, <laughs> or just go for you know, like that that one. Um, keep, Stay winning Lane Kiffin song. Fourth fourth down and 40, we're going for that. You know, might, might as well. <laughs> um, but, you know, let's say you, you, you walk into the shoe, you do see them dot the I. Uh, you see the kickoff. FAU is going to take the field. What is, for Dan and Shane, what is y'all's reaction going to be if Nick Tronti comes out leading the offense to be the quarterback to take on the Buckeyes. I hope we're running the triple option. <laughs> It'll be similar to when uh, when Daniel Parr came out that 
against Navy, I think. Uh, I was hyped for that, man. I was on I was on the Par Nation, baby. Yeah. I'm still on Par Nation. Anyway, yeah, he's doing well at Duquesne. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's certainly Lane, you know, Lane hasn't said anything of, official about it, but judging from the scrimmages and, and, you know, research that, that you know, both you guys and what you've seen in practices and in the scrimmages, um, it, Robinson is, is kind of, kind of clearly the guy. Um, and, and I think also I, I, one thing I will be looking for in this game is to see like last year you could see, like and you could sense that like this is he's a redshirt freshman who got kicked off the team that he's going back to play, you know after after the hype of 2017 that was he was put in prob just about the worst worst situation that anybody that that a redshirt freshman making his first start could could come into. So I, I'm interested. You know he seems to have a, maybe a little bit more swagger this year, a little more confidence. Um, I, I think he's probably excited and, and certainly much less nervous than he was last year. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing how, if, if, you know, if, and when Chris Robinson uh, trots out there, I'm looking forward to see how he handles himself. Well, how about, how about this? Who do you guys think puts us in the best position? I'm not going to say to beat Ohio state, to beat the spread, which is currently 27 a, and then B who puts us in the best position to win more games for the Ron. So who could learn the most by playing an Ohio State defense on the road? Chris, he's going to be our starter for the future. I, I think this is what – when Lane said, you know, he still hasn't decided yet, I, I think there is a little bit of truth to that. And, you know, you just don't, there's no point announcing to start telling anyone outside of the team. Um. I do think there was also something interesting and Jake Elman tweeted it out on the Owls Nest account and um, that there was this thought of maybe using two quarterbacks. Um, I think they could be misinterpreted a little bit. One, I think if it's a lopsided game, I think both will play regardless. You want to get both some reps in there. Um, I also think, and I said this, I wish I just would have tweeted it out. Um, I just thought early in camp, I said, I was discussing with somebody about the team at this, and I said, you know, I think Tronti, even if he's not the starting quarterback, has some ability to do some things because he's a big kid and he can run. So maybe there's some certain packages they can use for him, goal line, some plays, trick plays, get him in there. He can, you know, he's still a good quarterback. He's, like I said, there's definitely some use for him. So I'm a little curious if – yeah. That's maybe they're thinking. I don't know. I haven't seen anything. Um, but I think there's some stuff to Lane's bag of tricks, you know, we talk about, you know, with, uh, you know, the, that type of stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we, you know, see Tronti, even if Persons even play a little well um, out there in some packages and yeah. try and use his big frame and his ability to run. Yeah, I mean that that's certainly um like you said Lane is not adverse and I don't think Chris is um the type of quarterback or really Lane runs the type of system that they're not going to try to take advantage of every person that they have. It, like Chris is not the type of quarterback that you that you leave out there, you know, no matter what because he's your best option. Um and they kind of showed that last year and last year they were kind of searching for a QB. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's ha having Trotty out there. I don't think we'll see both of them uh, out there at the same time, but um, it get, I think gives you gives you some good options, and I think it's it, it's worth it. I mean, if he he's got a, a skill set that is different than uh, than Chris Robinson's. Like you said, he's a, a little bit bigger guy. He can get you one or two yards. Where you know, with Chris has got a heck of an arm, but he's lacking a little bit in size and, and heft. I guess you could say. Um, to where to get a fourth and one, which last year we you know we saw that plenty of times, and that was a lot of times the offensive line got blown up. But you know he he couldn't really move the pile, he couldn't really find the hole to get that one or two yards that were needed. So having Trotty come in, I I, I can see that. Um, I I think if we're in a fourth and one situation in Columbus, I'm just saying that Malik Harrison is just going to blow through us. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Tronti or, or, or Chris trying to gain the, that one extra yard. We should just give it to B.J. Emmons in that case and have the two. Big, 
yeah. two biggest dudes on the field. It's like an Oklahoma drill, just running at each other, and we just hope for the best. <laughs> Have you guys seen the um, the picture of Ohio State? And many see him as one of the best players in the country, and he's probably a top five draft pick going into next year. Uh, their defensive end, Chase Young. Yeah, it looks it looks it looks photoshopped. It looks like he's standing closer to the camera than everybody else. Six 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 <laughs> and a half. Where do you where do you read? Two seventy two eighty, and only like ten percent body fat. He was standing next to a guy that was six three two thirty, and it's it it might as well have been me. Brandon Walton has his hands full, so I you know and they move around, but they 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 had. He's unbelievably good, and they have so many talented players on their defense as well. Um, their linebackers are a little young. Maybe we can attack that. Um, I think, you know, on offense, though, I'm more curious to see what our running back rotation is. Mm. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of been discussion with the wide receivers, and uh, John Mitchell's practicing. It sounded like he'll play. Like, they didn't want to guarantee it. You never know on these things, so it wasn't too serious. Um but, you know, I, and I'm also just curious to see how much they change in the scheme from last year now that they don't have, you know, motor in yeah. white. I wonder if there's a little bit of a scheme change, a little bit of a different thought process, because they weren't going to change much from 2017 to 2018. So I want to see how much different the offense looks like. And don't, don't forget that Ohio State also is going to have some new schemes. Uh, they have a new head coach who – was the acting head coach when the whole Urban Meyer scandal was happening. Uh, which one? Yeah, which one, exactly. Yeah, the, the one at the beginning of last season um, with the, the domestic assault cover-up. Ryan Day uh, was acting head coach, went 3-0, and wins over Oregon State, Rutgers, you know, some real tough competition there, but then a solid... They beat TCU on the road. Exactly, yeah. but then beat TCU in Arlington. Uh, so that was an impressive win. And now he has the reins of the program full time. But that being said, he only retained one assistant. Uh, so they're going to be going under a new scheme, both offensive and defensively. Justin Fields, he was a transfer from UGA. So he's only been with the program in Columbus since, what, January, February or so? Granted, he was the number two overall prospect in 2018. But, you know, he's still new. He's still learning. Um, so it, it, I, I'm curious about how we're going to do with our new schemes. I'm nervous how we're going to do with their, with our new schemes, uh, defensively, but by that same token, Ohio state is doing everything new for the first time. Um, I, I do disagree about their linebackers. Uh, yeah, they are young, but they're experienced. They retain their top four linebackers. Again, I, I think Malik is just a joke. Um, but I mean, Shane, you mentioned this a couple a couple weeks ago. It's like I didn't know every single player could be six four, two fifty. Like it, it doesn't matter like how young or how inexperienced they are. They're all six four and two fifty. They're cyborgs. They're robots. FAU is a college football team. Ohio State's a semi pro. Or <laughs> they're a triple. They're a triple A baseball team. I mean, it's what they are at this point. It's. It's just a different level. You know, I did, you know, we're talking about Ohio State a lot and Lane did an interview on our 640, the new radio partnership with FAU. And, you know, Andy Slater asked Lane, you know, what are these games good for? And Lane said money. Um, yeah. I, I believe we're getting 1.4, 1.5 from Ohio State. Uh, and, and, you know, Andy was kind of following up on that. Um, and Lane was saying, you know, kind of in the future, we want to try and play – the middle team in one of the big power five conferences, the middle type teams, and you get the same paycheck as opposed to the very best. Like last year we played Minnesota. I only think um, 2024, maybe 2022, we played Clemson on the road. Um, that's the last, that's the next time we play one of these huge uh, powers. Um, and who knows, Dabo could be at Alabama by then. Right. So, um, you know, they're trying to get away with playing the Alabamas, the Ohio States, because there's an avenue to play, you know, at Illinois or the Indianas and the Minnesotas and the, you know, the Boston colleges of the world um, for pretty much the same check. 
uh, but yeah. you know you have a chance in those games for the most part. I th- I think we're we're forcing it. <laughs> it's, it's it's great to have a coach that doesn't say, uh, well, you know, it's great for the guys to go get experience and um, and like doesn't mention the money at all. Like, it's like yeah, it's it, there's there's a fat check and we're gonna take it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a good point uh, when you you. We FAU, I think, is at a point, a touch beyond having to take. I remember, you know, all of us remember the Sun Belt days where it was we were starting the season zero and three, zero and four, because we had Alabama, uh, Wisconsin, and you know Florida uh, for the first three games of the year because we needed the paycheck. It's it's nice that we're you know kind of down to two of those games, and if we can get into a, a place like Minnesota or Indiana or. Um, you know, those, those type of schools and still get a, a, a semi uh, good payout like that. I think that's, um, that's advantageous. And, um, and FAU needs a money game a year. You know, I've been told yeah. they, you know, they still written into their budget. They need to go have someone pay them 1.3, 1.5 million, whatever the number may be. Um, that's why like a lot of people ask, you know, in the controversy at UCF with the two for ones is people don't realize when you do a two for one, the team on the one side has to eat money, whether you're UCF and you're giving up an extra home game or an FAU's case. So um, I was reading a little bit of the details of the USF Alabama two for one. And, you know, basically people don't realize USF pays Alabama to come there pretty much their cost, which is like 700,000. And since it's part of a two for one, USF gets way less to go to Alabama. So they're only getting like, I think, a million to go to Alabama twice. So a million minus, you know, 500 or three quarters of a, or 2 million minus. I think total, we're only getting like 1.4, 1.3 from the coming out ahead from three games from playing Alabama. If you understand what I'm saying, kind of fall with my complicated math there. When they could have just gone to Alabama twice and got an extra one million dollars you know they're, they're giving up a lot to have that extra home game which you, you shrug your shoulders and it's like you know um and then you do a n- number of two for ones and then you got to start moving your schedule around because then, then there's going to be years where you end up playing way like only six sometimes uh in, in the american conference they want to play seven home games so they got to do all this moving around so they only play six home games and then that costs them there so right. two for ones, the reason why ESPN and all the big, well, you got to earn it to play it thing, which it's complete bull because yeah. P5s and P5s have played one for ones forever. And then all of a sudden it's, oh no. I mean, I, I was listening down here to a radio station saying, oh, you, UM should never play a one for one with UCF. They're a, we're above them. You played a one for one in 07 and 08 with UCF. Right. They have one for one. It's already happened. Now all of a sudden it's out of reach. It's, you know, yeah. it's, it's, they know, you know, the P, the P, power five schools know that G fives have to sacrifice a lot to do a two for one more than just an extra home game. So if they don't want to schedule them, they're not, they're taking less chances by going out on the road and playing a school where they could get that loss. Not that ESPN would have just make a bunch of excuses for them anyways, but well, it was an off day. They didn't really, they didn't really want to be there that day, you know, all that good stuff. And, and that's the thing, Shane, is that ESPN is also the one that's paying those bigger schools, those conferences. And then they say, you know, oh, you know, they shouldn't be doing one for ones. They shouldn't even be scheduling these G5 teams because they have nothing to gain from it. University of Florida used to play University of Tampa at Tampa Stadium in the 70s. <laughs> this, this, this is how, teams used to go to play Southern Miss, to play Marshall. East Carolina right. recently, until about five, six years ago, uh, yeah, would host. They had a home game versus Oklahoma State when they used yeah. to play at Dolphin Stadium or whatever. That was my, that was my first game as a uh, member of the marching band. That was my, my freshman year. We lost. Like, it was on ESPN2. We lost like 23 to 3. <laughs> it's, it's just – and now all of a sudden – they got to protect the P5 brand so they know if they create this two for one and, you know, it, they know, they said, yeah, we'll just say they have to play two for one. They either take a, they either eat crap from scheduling it, then we'll schedule yeah. two for one, then you'll eat crap. They know that it'll hurt the G5 school in the long run. 
or they just don't schedule it and none of their teams have to take a chance playing a road game. Because in the end, college football, being on the road is tough. I don't care who you are. Outside of right. 10 teams in the country, you go play somewhere on the road in a school that's real hyped up for you to play against. That goes wrong for a lot of college football teams. Really quick. They can't understand, understand they have to protect the SEC and the ACC network teams. Yeah, yeah you know, especially now. I think it's, there's a lot of misinformation out there with how scheduling works in college football. It, it, it's a whole lot more nuanced. You know, we kind of broke it down a little bit here, but it, it is a whole lot more nuanced as, um, well, we want, let's, let's play you because it makes sense. Like, foot, FAU has never played Florida State and probably won't happen for a while. Um, and not, not necessarily because, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be good for us, but there's, there's bigger factors into um, – it, into just scheduling. So, yeah, it, it's, I think this was a, a, a good conversation to kind of hash some things out. And it's going to become more difficult in the future because I think, thank you to UCF, I think we're heading towards an 18 playoff yeah. in the next five, six years. And you're starting to see even Florida, who traditionally never schedules out-of-state games. They scheduled a game versus Texas recently. You're starting to see a bunch of these big um, – major programs scheduling each other because I think what's going to happen when you go to an 18 playoff what it'll look like is you know what they're talking about now is you'll have your five conference champs winners right Mm -hmm. one g5 representative so basically your best highest rank g5 um, team and then you'll have two wild cards so what I think the power conferences are thinking saying well we could take more risks and play some of these bigger games because even if we lose one um, it's not going to hurt us a lot because we can still a win the conference. And if we go 11 and one and our one loss was because we went and played USC, you know, Florida said we wouldn't play USC or Texas on the road, right. we'll be fine. So, and then I think there's also just going to be a push to and Nick Saban said it a couple weeks ago that he believes all power te- five teams should play at least 10 power five games. Um, you know, so that's going to just make things more difficult for us in the future. For sure. For, yeah, Flo- I remember there's some crazy stat that Florida hasn't played an out-of-conference away game in, like, decades. Like, they 92. haven't. Um, they played Syracuse. Yeah. 1992. It was, they've not played an out-of-conference away game or uh, out of the state of Florida. So they played yeah. out-of-conference games against Miami and Florida State. Right, yeah. But, it was out of the state of Florida, um, an out of conference game, and it was like Syracuse in 1992, and they lost. Yeah, um, I still remember that. So. <laughs> I mean, hey, Clemson, you know, struggled against Syracuse in the Carrier Dome a couple of years ago. So tough place to play when it gets packed. So shout out to Jake Elman for yeah, all his over there. Jake's listening to this. Yeah. It happens, and, and I think you know, not to get on our scheduling soapbox, but I've said this all the time. I said. You know, part of what angers me about the whole strength of schedule argument is people just look at the po- opponent directly. But like, I always find this. In the SEC, Alabama either gets a, get a bye week before they play LSU every year, and then they get a cupcake before Auburn. So they're always getting time off before, you know, before there's huge difficult games. To me, right. a difficult thing in scheduling is – we see this with Conference USA teams all the time. It's, oh, you know, we played a huge game, and now we have a short week where we have to go on the road again. You know what I mean? Alabama would never have to play a big game Saturday night and then go on the road and play a team Thursday. Yeah, Alabama's not playing – or those type of teams, they're not playing on Thursday nights. Yeah, so it's <laughs> like, you know, it's like with UCF, you know, coming down here. I mean, that's, that's a tough game. They're going to go on the road, in-state, rival. We watch this stuff in college football all the time. Arizona, 11-point favorites. I say I haven't watched that. It was one of the best. Spoiled. They just they lost to Hawaii. You know, they had to go travel on the road, go, you know, play three, you know, play – it was three uh, – Hawaii's through another three hours behind their time. Um, you know, we see that type of stuff all the time in college football. When teams have to travel and you take young kids on these trips, teams tend to struggle – and the yeah. big schools eliminate it and said, yeah, we're going to play four true road games, all in conference. Right. 
Yeah, which means they're not traveling very far, probably the same time zone and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, we got to go up to ESPN and say, hey, let's get a one and one going with Washington State. <laughs> Think about right. the two, the two head coaches. All right, the jokes will write themselves, and that is a game that everyone is going to watch for the press conferences alone. That would be an awesome bowl game, Washington State and FAU. Imagine the points. So many points. Yeah. That was – actually, but, you know, back – when was that? 2011, maybe? I started a, a Why We Should Hire Mike Leach thread. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, – that was I, I was hopeful back then. It's does does he have a, a winter home in Key West or something, or does he just? Yeah, he spends a lot of time there. Well, he was um, college roommates with uh, Craig Angelos. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thing, Shane, I, I'm I'm curious though when when it comes to your trip to Columbus, uh, what what is one thing that you are most looking forward to experiencing up there? Um, vodka sodas not being eleven dollars. I mean, it's yeah. going to college bars, right? I mean, that's really, you know, yeah, yeah. being able to go out and order three drinks and not spend 42 bucks. Like, it's, I've been to Alabama. I've been to Auburn. I've been to South Carolina. Um, Wisconsin was actually my favorite trip. Um, hmm. It's just the coolest town we've been to so far. So we've heard a lot of good things about Columbus. Um, you know, so it, I, I just kind of like just being in the college towns. It's just a little different vibe than you can sometimes when you're being in, when you're in South Florida. No doubt. Only yeah. like a really large group of friends. Yeah, um, Norman, Norman was a good time despite how hot it was and despite the game lasting longer than the first five minutes of the first quarter. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the people there are really nice. And college towns, they're, they're, they're just a, a, a different type of people that, that are there that we don't really experience in Boca um, or anywhere south of I-4, for that matter, um, in the state yeah. of Florida. It's it's interesting feel. Uh, you get drinks for cheap. Uh, you get to make friends. People are friendly and everything. Uh, even after the Oklahoma game, before the Oklahoma game and after, people were, were getting us drinks and everything. I, I was yeah, there. Uh, Alabama the- fans were great, though, to us. Um, they're a little – and I've heard terrible things about Ohio State fans. So, hopefully um, – we're wrong about that. Yeah. Both both my roommates are huge Michigan fans, so they've warned me for you. So definitely be careful. Auburn was a good trip. We both had a good time on that one. They were they were very nice over there too. So speaking, so well, we'll kind of kind of wrap things up. So the the connections between between Ohio State uh, and and you guys may know more. So connection obviously is Pat Shun. Some history, FAU basketball beating Ohio State, essentially ending uh, their head coaches. He was a terrible head coach there anyway. But um, I was trying to think of other connections between – We took two or three of them in baseball. I had this conversation. Yes. So we own Ohio State, basically. Right, right? yeah. Yeah. If we're going over overall record, yeah, we totally own The last four meetings of our sports, sorry to – I don't – actually, I'd have to check softball, but I just know – not last year. I think the year before we took th- two or three of them in baseball, and we beat them in basketball. So that basketball game was not- nuts. By the way, can we yeah. all agree with that? How, how yes. crazy! I don't remember much from that from that night. So I'm gonna it was, say it was a good game. I, I don't know. I, I, that, that's a good. I, I forgot about baseball. That was a good one. Um, so yeah. So we're uh, Saturday. We're coming out winners, no matter what. Coming out winners. Um, the Florida Atlantic University will come out victorious, no matter what. <laughs> Either at the in the win column or with the uh, the paycheck. Yeah. Quick recap: twelve noon. The game is on Fox. We got their go-to Gus Johnson. Um, we got the go-to uh, team calling us. Hopefully, it's a, a little better. Uh, they they called the Oklahoma game as well. Yeah. So twelve o'clock Fox and. Uh, we are we, we didn't really go over keys to victory we we're going to go over or we went over keys to breaking this or beating the spread that's that's what we're hoping for so you know make sure that you're following all of us on twitter we'll, we'll keep saying this uh, because there is more 
uh, especially Shane and Jack, are really giving more uh, to the Nest. Make sure you're following them on Twitter, following them on the Nest, because there's a lot of great content coming out. So subscribe to FAUL's Nest on YouTube, because there's still, you know, we put it gets posted there, and I see a lot of people watch it there. Obviously, check it out at the Nest, but check it out on check us out on Spotify and iTunes. Uh, we're really excited to um, to be able to to reach you guys on more platforms this year. So. Uh, for uh, Jack and Shane. That's it for us tonight, and go Owls.